This is part four, chapter four. We're up to paragraph seven. Okay, this is a long exposition of the second thing we say in the Shema, which isn't part of the biblical passage at all. Blessed or praised is the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. By the way, just as a piece of vocabulary, the word la'olam in Hebrew, which is often translated as forever, Maimonides says it's not a mistranslation because you have a phrase very often in Hebrew, la'olam va'ed. What does the va'ed add if, it's, if la'olam is already forever? So he says only when it's la'olam va'ed or la'ad la'olam, when you have an addition to the word la'olam, is it really forever. Otherwise, it does not connote forever. So when you have, let's say, a Jewish slave, <coughs> and the verse says, he shall serve his master forever, and the rabbis interpret that to mean until the Jubilee, and the incautious reader who's struggling along in English says, well, Rabbi, it says forever, doesn't it? How could they put a limit on it, huh? Didn't the rabbis know what forget forever meant? Yeah, that's because he didn't read Maimonides. The olam doesn't mean forever. And the Chazal actually touched it as if it were poetry. La olam Moshe Yovel, to the olam of the jubilee, which, which puts a, a limit on it. And as the Rashba says in the tshuva, how could you take it literally? It says that the slave shall serve his master forever? Is the master going to live forever? Surely not, right? The master's going to die sooner or later. So you couldn't have taken it to mean literally forever. That's nonsense. Okay, just a little, a little detail. So this here says, blessed is the name of God, the glory of God's kingdom. That means forever. Now, roughly, what is a name? What is a name? When I was uh, studying this, about uh, 102 years ago, approximately. Um, I was uh, learning and teaching American pragmatism in the university, and I happened to be studying Lahavdul, the, the pre tzaddik and I found that they two of them have the same definition of what a name is. Uh, and it was quite, uh, one was Charles Sanders Peirce, the founder of American uh, pragmatism. I was quite interested to see a name is a three-part relation. There's a thing, there's a speaker, and then there's an artifact which the speaker uses to talk about the thing. The name sets up a relationship between the speaker and the thing. Now, <clears throat> that's what it does functionally. Now, when you have a name, a name is part of your vocabulary, and you use it, what does the name mean to you? Now, what I'm going to say, if somebody knows the philosophy of the 20th century, is very controversial, and I'm aware of that. 
Van Allen and Kripke and, and, and all the rest of them, but I'm not doing that right now. Roughly, for the user, the name connotes what he knows about the object that has the name. There's a lot about the object he doesn't know. There's something about the object he does know. When he uses that word, that word which for him is a label for that thing, what's going on in his mind is roughly what he knows about that thing. That's why we distinguish over and over again in our literature between the thing and its name. When we say the third blessing in the, in the Shema Hasrei, sound fair. Yeah. Ato Kadosh, Shem Kadosh. You are holy and your name is holy. That's not the same thing. That's two different, different concepts. Roughly, when I say Ato, I'm referring to the totality, almost all of which I don't know. When I say your name, then I'm referring to what I do know. And then my attitude is, well, when I take the name, I'm speaking about the conceptions that I have, and I see that those conceptions are, are all uh, filled with holiness, the conceptions of aspects of holiness. But I know that the reality far outstrips my concepts. And when I say that you're holy, I mean to say that going beyond what I can understand and appreciate, holiness applies there as well in ways that I, don't, I, can't, I can't understand, but I don't want... I don't want the, the, the mistake to be made that what I conceive of is the whole reality. There's nothing beyond it. That's a mistake. So here, when it says, uh, Blessed or praised is the name of the greatness of his kingdom, we're talking about the part that's manifest to us. We're not talking about what goes beyond that. We're talking about the part, the part that's manifest to us. Now, Manifestation is relative, relative to your, who you are and what you are and what your station is. And he says in this paragraph that there are certain things, for example, that are visible to the angels that are invisible to us. We're, we are in a condition where our vision is temporarily obscured. Temporarily obscured. And in the meantime, they see things that we don't see. That's the reason why, for example, there's some praises we give of God, and we say, every time we utter that praise, that we're saying it the way the angels say it, because we're saying, left to our own devices, we would not be able to, to utter these words. We wouldn't know what they meant. We would not be able to take responsibility for the words. Holy, holy, holy. Kodosh, kodosh, kodosh. Hashem Tzvokos. Hashem of the hosts of heaven. The whole world is full of his glory. That is a quotation from a verse in Isaiah where he saw the angels giving this praise to God. We say this many times in our prayers. Every time we say, we're saying it just as the angels say it. We mention that because on our own, we couldn't have taken responsibility for it. We're just saying what they say. Now, it's worthwhile. They have a vision of something we don't have. They formulate it into words. We take it from them because it has their authority and we use it to praise God. It's a wonderful thing to do. But we're very careful to say that we're doing it on the, on the basis of, their, of their, um, their position, their perception. And having said that, I want to add a footnote, something which well, you know, I quote my oldest son often. <coughs> Angels have no free will or almost no free will, uh, no significant free will. They give praise to God. What's that for exactly? It's sort of like God re records praises of himself and then you know, plays them back. <laughs> he enjoys hearing them over and over again. The, the, the thing is only a machine. Um, so he said, let's imagine a machine that announces the temperature. You could have two machines like that. You, take, uh, you make a recording of the words, the temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. And you set it to play back every hour on the hour. Every hour on the hour. Summer, winter, it is, the temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. Okay, well that's really meaningless because almost every time it plays it's false. Right? <laughs> it's not registering anything. 
And of course, it would be ridiculous. It would be absolutely just a, just a nuisance. But then you have a thermostat. Now imagine a thermostat. They have them attached to the speakers, which every hour call out the, th the temperature that the thermostat measures. That's not meaningless. It's measuring an objective reality. And it's expressing an objective reality. Angels are like thermostats. They're not like tape recorders. They're like thermostats. So when the, the angel is a glory meter, a greatness meter, a praise meter, so what the angel says is an objective measure of the greatness of what it's talking about. Yes, they don't have free will. Of course, God doesn't need to hear this. But on the other hand, putting such a meter in the creation gives us access to this information. So it's not meaningless. Anyway, that's the way to, to understand this idea. So there is the name of the glory of God's kingdom. That name is our perception of it. It's, and there's a, a perceptions from different points of view. They generate different types of reactions. And uh, each of those reactions has its own value. Yeah. How are we to uh, access this measure of the angels as a thermostat for the glory? And how, did, how does it relate to us in, in our ability to make that connection to Hashem? So I don't think we access it. He makes it accessible to us, as he did by giving these verses, this whole vision to Isaiah, including that verse. Right? He made it accessible to us. We don't do something to access it. Um, now, obviously, it means that although we couldn't discover it, but we can learn something from it. Now, what we learn from it is maybe skin deep, because from, from their point of view, it's much deeper than, than what we get. But it's better having the skin deep uh, appreciation of it than having nothing. So and that's why, as I say, we, when we say it, we always say we're saying what the angels say. Now, this depends upon the nusuch that you have. If you're um, unfortunate enough to be davening a Lithuanian, I mean, I, I didn't say that. Um, you know, but if you're lucky enough to be davening a, a Hasidic or a Sephardi nusuch, um, then in, 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 in all the times we say Kedusha, we say, we sanctify God's name the way the angels do in heaven or together with the angels, except for Musaf and Shabbos, where it says, they declare your praise together with us. Well, at that point, we initiate. And they follow up. Of course, we're using their words. That's true. We are using their words. Under those conditions, we rise to a position where we initiate the praise and they join us. I could hear that as a difference of opinion in, in, in metaphysics or in theology as to whether that really happens or doesn't. That's why you have the two different ways of, of saying it, the Ashkenazi way, the Sephardi way. But that's, uh, that's, that's part of what's going on. By the way, ha having said that, I want to share something with you because this... Uh, give me a sitter. This, this doesn't matter. I think they're all the same. Thank you very much. You know, when we say Kodosh Kodosh in the, in, 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 in the first blessing before the Shema, and when we say it, <coughs> we say it in Gedusha, um, there's a very interesting phrase, which I think people, until I saw something in the Ramchal, I had no clue what it was about. Sorry? I, I, I had no clue what it was about. Uh, before you say Kodosh Kodosh, what you say is this. Uh, they, the angels, all accept upon themselves the yoke of heavenly sovereignty from one another. They, from one another, they invite one another to declare allegiance to God and grant permission to one another to sanctify the one who formed them. They get permission. In other words, they sort of coordinate their performance together by each one checking with the other whether they're ready to go with tranquility, calm, clear articulation, sweetness, all of them as one proclaim His holiness. The picture here is of a, like a choir. A choir with a conductor, and each one looks at the other and feels the other one's breathing, and everyone gives forth the melody uh, together, sweetly, clearly, calmly, with tranquility. 
Okay. Then, before we quote the verse from Ezekiel, the Ophanim, one type of angel, and the Chayas Kodesh, with great noise, noise! How did noise get in here? Great noise! Elevate themselves to be on the same level as the Srofim, and then they say, Baruch Kvot Hashem Imkomo. What happened here? How do we get to noise? Says the Ramchal, the The noise here is the noise of Gullus, of exile. This is a verse that's taken from Ezekiel. Ezekiel lived in Babylon. And Isaiah saw them in Israel, in the temple. In the, the, the area of the temple. So these are two different pictures. Two entirely different pictures. And you have to appreciate the kodosh, kodosh, kodosh. is like a choir. You know? And the king in his home is throne of glory. And here, exile has confusion and noise. And it doesn't say anything about coordinating and giving permission to each other and sweetness and tranquility. None of that. No, just noise. It's an entirely different picture. So we have to appreciate that these things change depending upon the condition that the Jewish people are in. This is what the angels say. But uh, what the angels say depends upon the condition that we're in also. Okay. Now. Now, the, the rest of the Shema, the three paragraphs in the Shema, we have the first sentence that we talked about. Um, there's what's called accepting the yoke of his kingdom, which we spoke about. I'm going to mention it again now. And after that is the yoke of the commandments. As uh, the Chazal comment, uh, you, you, you must prior accept the authority of the king before you can accept the commandments as commandments. Meaning there's a command and I, have, and I have an obligation to fulfill them. That's because they come from an authority that I recognize. And then the third paragraph is the paragraph of, um, of remembering the exodus from Egypt. Now, the first thing that we are told in the Shema is to love God all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your, now sometimes it's translated might, but the many translation is resources, property. And there is a secret here. If you think about it, all your heart is taken to mean whenever you make a decision, whenever you set your priorities or your goals, or the means that you're choosing to achieve your goals, the topmost idea is what does God want? What does he want from me? With all your soul means, there are times when you have to give up your life rather than transgress. Someone says to you, kill Ruvain or I'll kill you, your answer has to be, kill me. I'm not, I'm not committing murder. I'm not doing that. Sorry. So, now imagine someone who loves God with all his heart and with all his soul, neither of which, by the way, implies the other. There are people whose everyday behavior is impeccable, organized, focused, may say even perfect, put a gun to their heads and they go to pieces. They just can't die. They just can't do it. And on the contrary, you have people who, ah, Shabbos, next week. This week I have a date, scuba diving. I'll, I'll keep Shabbos next week. You know. But when the oppressor says, bow to the idol, he says, I'm sorry. Shabbos, yes, Shabbos, no, I don't bow to idols, period. You can kill me, I don't do that. In the Spanish Inquisition, in the Portuguese Inquisition, you had people who, in their ordinary lives, were not uh, obviously outstanding, but they would not, get, they would not commit uh, treason to the Jewish people, and they died. <clears throat> but now imagine a person who has both. And then the verse says, and look, sir, with all your heart, with all your soul, and by the way, don't forget your automobile. Don't forget your bank account. You know, that has to be included. Isn't that 
anticlimactic, isn't that an afterthought? Why, how could you imagine someone who loves God with all his heart, with all his soul, and leaves out his property? How could that be? So I heard on this subject something very wise from my late mother-in-law. She lived through the Depression in 1929. <clears throat> it's famous that there were people who committed suicide. They lost their money, they jumped off buildings. The observation was made then, in 1929. This guy who jumped off a building in 1929, suppose in 1927, he had lost a child. Would he have committed suicide? Do you hear of parents who commit suicide because it was a child? I think it's vanishing. You don't hear such a thing. Okay, that's number one. Now number two, if you ask this guy, the guy who committed suicide in 1929, ask him in 1927, what do you love more, your money or your children? Of course he would say his children. And he wouldn't be lying, but look, when he jumps off the building, he leaves his children orphans. He can't live without his money, so he leaves his children orphans. He could live without his children, but he can't live without his money. So, it seems like the money takes up more of his identity than his children. And he doesn't know this. That was her point. He wasn't even aware of it. Money can eat up your identity without you even being aware of it. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know why you're doing what you're doing. I remember an interview with an entrepreneur. This was in New York 25 years ago. Someone who, she, she was a vice president in some corporation, certainly earning in six figures 25 years ago when six figures was more valuable. Um, and I thought to myself, what is she doing to earn in six figures at the age of 25? She's working 60 or 70 hours a week. Does she have a life? Does she have friends? Does she have time for recreation, for meditation, for expanding her horizons, for reading, for travel? No, it's 50, 50 weeks a year, 70 hours a week, and if she's making a quarter of a million, that's because she's earning for the company a million. They're not losing money on her. But what happened to her life? And she's not even aware of it. She thinks she's on top of the world. She doesn't know what she's giving up. So one thing I, t I ask people to take a look at, you're living in Israel. Take a look at how people live. Many of the people whom you will visit are living on a level of, of uh, standard of living which in America would be absolutely unacceptable. You'd be embarrassed to death to live this way. Nine people in a three-room apartment? No climate control, no thick carpets on the floors, no three cars for the family, no vacations in Alaska. How do you live this way? You wouldn't be able to present yourself in public. You have a three-year-old Porsche? You're dead! Get a new Porsche! Here, nobody owns a car. We use public transportation. Now look around. Are there people sitting on the porches, dead drunk because their lives are no lives? Are they suffering from drug addiction, from, from uh, suicide, from uh, violence? Gee, it doesn't look that way. It doesn't look that way. Talk to them. Visit them in their homes. They seem to be doing pretty well, actually. There's a picture, it's a snapshot of what life can be without what would be regarded as an absolutely minimal standard of living in the United States. That should be something you take on board. Think to yourself, so what do I want with my life? What do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? And certain groups where one of the key words that you hear, especially throughout your childhood and early adulthood, is success. 
We want you to be a success. It will, very often, the success means six figures. If you're not earning six figures, you know, and the first figure should be a four or a five, then, you know, you're just not making it. What are you paying to make it? What are you giving up to make it? So, um, I think that's part of what's going on here. The Torah says, analyze yourself. Meditate on this. What am I doing about my standard of living? What am I invest investing to get it? What am I giving up because I'm investing that to get it? I think that's a very important... Uh, I know a guy came to Israel, he's a PhD in physics. He fixes refrigerators. It takes less time and he makes enough money and he has time to learn, he has time for his family. Could he have gotten a high tech job? Yeah, 50, 60 hours a week, he could have done that. He chose not to. Go tell your friends in America, oh, you know what I'm doing in Israel? I'm fixing refrigerators. <laughs> How many, how many likes will you get on your Facebook account? Huh? Yeah. I'm not saying that the appropriate response to uh, being broke or losing a job would be to kill yourself, obviously, but we do say that someone that has no money is compared to someone that's dead. Um, if he was robbed, it's as if the person had killed him. But we don't say the same thing about if someone takes their children. On the contrary. We actually do. Um, the Gemara over there says that there are four people who are, now you have to be very careful, um, it means that they share something in common with the dead. That's the, way, the right way to translate the meaning of the what saved in the Talmud in context. And the four groups are uh, people who are impoverished and people who are blind and someone who has taras, which is a certain type of disease the Torah talks about, and someone who has no children. It's also one of the four. And what they all have in common is an inability to do the normal range of kindness to others. That's the sense in which they are compared to the dead. And the four divide up into two subcategories. Two out of the four lack the normal range of means to be able to do for others. And the other two lack the normal range of connection with others so as to be able to do for them. The poor and the blind lack the means. And the person who has taras is expelled from the city and he dwells in isolation. And if anybody wants to come near, he has to call out, I'm tummy, I'm tummy, I'm defiled, stay away from me. So he's cut off from other people. And the one who doesn't have children, because children call out in you an outpouring of loving kindness that you yourself don't even know you possess. When you'll have children, you'll see that you can do things with, and with only a sense of love and an identification, with no sense of irritation. You have, let's say, uh, a child who has... Um, um, colic. God forbid. A child with colic can cry for two weeks straight. Straight! He dozes for a while and wakes up crying. Screaming, crying. You pick up the child, you walk with the child, you carry the child, you sing to the child. You give the child a warm bath, you try to do for the child. And you don't think, how am I going to make it to work tomorrow? I'm going to be exhausted. Why do I have to put up with this? No, you don't think that at all. It's your child. So, indeed, that's the, the, the element that they have in common. And that's why King David says in the 113th Psalm, which is the beginning of Hallow, uh, God picks up the poor and the impoverished from their pains of poverty, to place them with Philanthropists, a not if he's a philanthropist. Yeah, it's translated in most places as prince, which is not too bad, but a nadiv is someone who gives. Because the spiritual curse in poverty is the inability to give to others. You don't have the resources to give to others. Okay? That's what's going on in that, in that, in that statement in the Gemara. Is it the same to say that someone cannot have children or someone had them but lost them? Would you compare them similarly? 
in terms of the, what I'm talking about now, it, it'd be the same thing because if you don't actually have children, then there's nothing that's calling out from you. So it's like the person who had money and lost it, right? It's the same thing, you don't have it. Now, uh, just one second. I think what I said is correct. I don't think it's limited to women in, in that respect. Okay, we're, we're, we're together so far? All right, fine. So now, um, so it then says the words that I, that I committed should be on your heart, and then you should transmit them to your children and all of the descendants. And uh, here, the word in Hebrew, shinantab, can include transmission. It can include verbal transmission. But it really means more than that. It really means something like training. When you will have children, and you think about how to bring them up, and what kind of experiences you want to give them, if you're like a normal parent, you will want your children to have the best. And you go through your experiences and you think, these are the experiences that built me. Or I see other people for whom these experiences were important and I want to give them to my children. I, I was born into the generation of people who were either immigrants or children of immigrants. And um, very few of our parents' generation went to college, but they saw that people who went to college did much better. That's what they saw, at least monetarily. And they sacrificed. We all went to college because our parents believed that they were giving us the best they could give us. Okay, so now you look at your own history and the things you've done, some things you would want to shield your children from, and some things which are uh, peripheral. You talk about how to understand the Creator how to relate to the Creator, how to live out the will of the Creator, there's nothing more important than that. The Torah here says that these words should be on your heart and you should transmit them. It's not just transmitting, it's giving over to your children the gift of the greatest life source that the world possesses. And it should be given over in that spirit. The children should feel that spirit of Moshe, uh, um, Feinstein, he lived in America through the, the 30s, the 40s, and there was the famous thing, people came to America, and uh, if you didn't work six days a week, you, you lost your job. I mean, the person that kept Shabbos every Monday was looking for a job. It was very, very difficult. There was one family where the father did that. He did that, he will not work on Shabbos, period. Friday night, he would come home, and they would have their Shabbos meal, and he would get up with his children and take their hands and dance in a circle, singing how precious it is to make sacrifices for Shabbos, to know that we're keeping Shabbos, how precious, and sing it with joy. And Rav Moshe said, that man's children will be special. There'll be something very special there because, because you know, there's, a, there's a, an expression in Hebrew, it's hard to be a Jew. They, they, the, the wise people of that generation said that those words killed the whole generation. If the parents are telling you over and over again it's hard to be a Jew, the child says, so why bother? Who needs it? It's so difficult, you know, do something else. He's saying it's joyful. It's joyful. Yes, it costs. But it's a joy to, 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 to make the sacrifice. And by the way, I was brought up reform, and I developed as you can see. Um, in reform, the whole procedure was to make it as easy as possible. What they didn't realize, I myself didn't realize until much later, until it was pointed out to me. When you make something easy, you're saying it's worthless. You're saying it's worthless. Because if it were worth something, then people would be willing to sacrifice for it. What you're communicating is it's not worth sacrificing for. We set up a, an adult education program in, in Baltimore where I was living. 
And we asked the heads of the yeshiva, shall we charge people for it or not? We were prepared to do it for nothing. He said, no, don't ever do anything for nothing. They themselves won't value it. Set a price. Set a price. You have a book that's, that's really important, don't give it away. You know, <laughs> you talk about free advice, right? They say free advice is worth what you paid for it. <laughs> the same thing, you know? If it's, if it's really valuable, yeah. anyway. So this is the idea of, of, of give it to the children as something that's, that's precious. And if you show them that you're sacrificing for it, that's a good message. It's worth sacrificing for. Now, this is not only for you, for, you, for you, for your children, grandchildren. It's for anyone who wants to learn. And ultimately, it's for all of mankind. Here, um, there's a famous verse in Isaiah that Jewish people should be or la goyim, a light to the nations. Here we have to appreciate what was and is God's plan for the world. Uh, most of you weren't here when I did this, when I did it in the first part of the, of the Sefer. Um, people are disturbed about the fact that humanity, from our point of view, has two levels, upper level and lower level. Guess who's on the upper level, hey? Mm-hmm. That's right. You put yourself on the top level, and all the super sophisticated psychology that goes together with analyzing that. And all. Yeah. But that wasn't the plan. Because had the original humans in the Garden of Eden succeeded at their challenge, there wouldn't have been two levels. There would have been one level, one homogenous humanity. And after the expulsion from, from the Garden of Eden, says the Ramchal in the part, first part of this book, there was an, a time when anyone and everyone could have lived in such a way as to realize the top potential of mankind in the expelled state and have some relationship to the original reality. Everyone could have done it equally. Abraham was the only one who did it, but everyone could have done it. And after that, when the world split up into 70 nations, any nation or part of a nation could have joined us and participated. That was stage three. And when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Sinai, he first offered it to all the nations of the world. Now listen, people get this wrong. In addition to us, not in place of us, it isn't as if there's going to be one recipient. It could be anybody you like. And we'll pick the, pick the first one and say, yes, we are going to get it for sure. There's no question about it. If we had said no, it would have been forced on us. But everybody could have joined us. So God did not set up a world with a two-tiered creation. Absolutely not. He made four separate efforts to reach everybody equally. He was rebuffed four times. Afterwards, the door is still open for conversion. The ideal um, development for mankind would be for everyone to convert and become Jewish. There's no commitment to a superior group and an inferior group. God didn't command it and didn't require it, but it would have been the, um, would have been the superior uh, conclusion. So our job is to project what God wants to the world as a whole, and what God wants for the world as a whole, which is for them to live up to the Jewish commandments for non-Jews. If they decide on their own that they want to take a further step and become Jewish, we test their sincerity by putting them through a rigorous per period of denial. And then when they show themselves to be really sincere, we accept them and we have special commandments to treat them with special favor, with special kindness, with special consideration, and even love. There's a mitzvah to love all Jews. And another verse that enjoins us to love converts as well, even though they're included in the first verse, but they have an extra because of, of what they've gone through to, to, uh, to transform their lives. So um, this idea of living out God's kingdom is something which requires us to relate to the rest of the world as well. When we are called Mameches Kohanim, the Goy Kadosh, as a nation of priests, the function of a priest is to be a go-between, to be a, a connecting rod 
The priest connects the people to whom he ministers with the Creator. That's his function. So if we are called a kingdom of priests, it means we're functioning as priests to the rest of the world and connecting them with God. And by the way, the temple in Jerusalem was available for non-Jews to offer sacrifices. Even non-Jews who were currently worshiping idols was not required to have pure belief for your sacrifice to be offered in the temple. So uh, that's the sense in which we are supposed to function as a, n a nation of priests as well. Now, the second paragraph mentions the mitzvahs in particular, and the third is the is the um, remembrance of the exit of, e of Egypt. I haven't got time to do that in detail now. I just want to point out one thing. Let's see. The third paragraph comes from the book of Numbers. Hmm. And it's a whole paragraph about fringes, strings that you put on the corners of your garments. Now, if you're going to pick a passage with which you remember the Exodus from Egypt, wouldn't it have been reasonable to take it from the book of Exodus? You know, the Exodus from the book of Exodus? Wouldn't that have been like the natural thing to do? Why would you go to the book of Numbers? And why would you pick a paragraph that has to do with Tzitzis? So there's a lot of literature on this, but I want to point out one thing. The last verse in that paragraph, which is the only verse in the paragraph that mentions the Exodus from Egypt, says, I am ashamed your God took you out of the land of Egypt to be your king. That verse describes the purpose of the Exodus, not the fact of the Exodus, but its purpose. And that's very, very important. It means that God's investment in our freedom is not because of some universal human value of freedom. No. After all, you could ask, if God stands for a universal human value of freedom, why didn't he invest in freeing other slaves? Indeed, you could ask, why did he only invest in our freedom temporarily? For the majority of our history, we haven't had an independent nation. Very often we've been enslaved, certainly brutalized and, and, and uh, punished by, by people among whom we live. Where is the investment in this universal value? No, the verse says, I took you out of Egypt to set up a certain relationship with you. That's why I did it. That's what justifies it. That's what justifies it. And if that's not the result, if you don't live up to that relationship, then you lose the rationale of being free. And then I'm not invested in your freedom anymore. This raises the whole question of what is the value of freedom, which is a nice philosophical question. I have spoken about it. It's on tape in the various places where they collect my, my uh, shiurim. Um, but our view is that the value of freedom is extrinsic. Freedom is a means to something else of value. There's no intrinsic value in being free. And this verse says it. I took you out to be your God. Your freedom is an investment in this relationship with me. That's what it's for. That's what gives the freedom its value. And if, indeed, you don't live up to that, then your freedom doesn't have value, and therefore it can be forfeited. It's a very powerful philosophical idea here. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit next time. Okay.